Hi everyone. In this video, I'll show you how to code out a Gordon Growth Dividend Discount Model and a Multisage Dividend Discount Model within Python. Before we get started, let's review the packages we'll use. These include YFinance, Pandas, NumPy, Matplotlib, IPython, and DateTime. I will say there are other APIs that you can use in order to scrape financial data. I found that within Python, Y Finance was the easiest to work with. And in order to code out some of the functions that we'll do in this notebook, you will need to use Y Finance. Let's start by defining what the dividend discount model is. And it is a quantitative method used for predicting the price of a company's stock based on the theory that its present day price is worth the sum of all of its future dividend payments when discounted back to their present value. And this is really the core concept of finance, where most of finance is either discounting future cash flows to the present or compounding present day values to the future. And something my professor used to always say is the value of any asset is the present value of all future cash flows coming from that asset. That concept at this point may seem a bit opaque, but as we code everything out and go through examples, I think it will start to make more and more sense. Let's get started by taking a look at the Gordon Growth Model. The Gordon Growth Model is used to determine the intrinsic value of a stock based on a future series of dividends, that grow at a constant rate. Here we have the formulas and we are going to code this out. In order to estimate the value of a stock using the Gordon growth model, we'll have to take the expected dividends per share and divide it by the cost of equity subtracted by the dividend growth rate. And I have both cost of equity and the dividend growth rate broken down a bit further. The cost of equity is the discount rate that a investor requires in order to hold the stock. And there is a formula that's used across finance. The way it's calculated is the risk-free rate plus beta multiplied by the market return minus the risk-free rate. Just to explain this a bit further, risk-free rate, that's usually used as US treasuries and bond rates because they're considered very safe. The market return can be a variety of different market returns based on where you are. In this case, we'll look at the US stock market and we can use the S&P 500 and we can also use SPY, which is an investable exchange traded fund or ETF and use that as a potential market return. Then we have beta. And what beta is, is it's the risk of a stock relative to the market. We'll get to take a look at the beta of a few stocks, but just something to note, if a company, if a stock's beta is over one, that means it's riskier than the mark in riskier than investing in the market itself. If a, if a company's beta is equal to one, then the, uh, the risk associated with the stock is on par with the market. And if the company's beta is below one, then the risk of investing that is less than the market. Finally, we have dividend growth rate. And here we have return on equity multiplied by one minus the payout ratio. And the way that return on equity is calculated is that return on equity is a company's net income divided by shareholders equity. And one minus the payout ratio is the retention rate. And that's the retained earnings of a company. So that means that it's the net profits that a company keeps after the payout ratio, which in this case will will focus on dividends as the payout ratio. Okay, great. Now let's actually get to coding this out. The first thing I'll do is I am going to choose a few companies that are known for dividend payments. And we'll get to see an example of how well the dividend discount model works for companies that pay dividends pretty frequently and have a 
high dividend yield, and we'll see how poorly it works for other companies that still pay a dividend, but the dividend is pretty low, and the forecast is a bit off. One of the companies that we'll take a look at is Stanley Black & Decker, and I'll save the ticker from Y Finance. We'll stay, save it into this variable called Stanley BD. And using this class ticker from Y Finance, we'll be able to download the financial data from Yahoo Finance. Let's run this. Great. And then I'll go through each one of these and I'll highlight the different ways that we bring this up. The first thing I'll do is I'll take a look at the beta of the stock. And because Stanley Black & Decker's beta is above one, that means that there is more risk associated with holding the stock relative to the market. In particular, this risk is known as systematic risk of holding Stanley Black & Decker. Because of this, there may potentially be a higher return that investors require for holding this individual stock because it is riskier. And that's just one measure of risk, but we'll save this variable into beta. The next thing that we'll look at is the risk-free rate. And the way that we'll do this is we can scrape the 10-year treasury note, which is commonly used as a risk-free rate in finance, as our risk-free rate. So let's take a look at that. And the risk-free rate at this point is 1.5%. And we'll just save that into a variable called risk-free rate. Next, we'll take a look at market return. And one of the potential issues is that returns have been very great and one of the potential issues we may have is that we have these very high market returns from the US market. And we can also take a look at NASDAQ and Dow and they're almost as high. NASDAQ is most likely higher than the S&P. And that may cause some issues when we try to value our stock. If we look at the three-year average return, it's 23.37% annually, and that is a very, very high return. What we'll do instead is we're going to override this, and instead of going with the S&P 500 re return, we'll manually put in a market return of 11%, which is a bit more conservative. Now we have all the variables we need in order to get our cost of equity. And then we are just going to code this out right now. And here we have the cost of equity or the required return for Stanley Black & Decker. And that is approximately 14.6%. And like many things in finance, this is an approximation and there's a lot of art versus signs here where other analysts might have a different market return, other analysts might use a different risk-free rate, and other analysts might calculate beta in a different way, which all leads to different cost of equity estimates for the stock. Okay, next we need to find the dividend growth rate. And using Y Finance, it does a great job in scraping the data. What we'll use is we're going to use the dot info function and the get info function in order to get the return on equity and the payout ratio to calculate the estimated dividend growth rate for Stanley Black and & Decker. And it's right around 12.44%. 
Finally, we need to also get the dividend per share for Stanley by Decker. And it's very simple. The way that we can do this is we can take the estimated dividend per share, multiply it by the previous close and the dividend yield. In this case, the dividend yield is the forward dividend yield. And when you're valuing a company, you always want to look at forward earnings and forward dividend yield, not the previous dividend yield. And that, that's something important to keep in mind. Let's run this now. And here, we this is also an annual number, meaning over a one-year period, we'll expect to collect $3.17 per share if we're holding Stanley Black & Decker stock. Okay, we have all of our info now. What we'll do is we'll code out the Gordon growth model into a function. I'll call it GGM model. And it is going to take a few different parameters. So it'll take div per share. That's going to be the first input the model requires. It will also require the cost of equity as well as the dividend growth rate. Then we can just put in return and it will be the dividend per share divided by the cost of equity subtracted by the dividend growth rate. And then let's try out our model. We have all of our variables defined already. We just need to plug it in and I'll save it into this variable called GGM forecasted price. And I'll use a bit of string formatting to print out the estimated price. Let's run this. Okay. Using the Gordon growth model and the our forecasted parameters, the estimated stock price is at $145.11. And this is very variable depending on the inputs. I'll show two different examples if we change some of these parameters. One of the parameters I'm going to change is the market return. And that's probably the trickiest thing for analysts to estimate because market returns have been so high and could we still expect that in the future. That's something that they need to think about when they are modeling this. And let's run this to take a look at what happens when we change it. And we can see that if we change the required market return within the cost of equity, that has a huge effect on the value of the stock. So if we set the required market return all the way down at 10%, it values the stock right under $400. But just going from 10% to 11% leads to a dramatic increase in the forecasted price of Stanley Black & Decker stock. And here we can see it's right at $145 and a few cents. And it continues to decrease as the required market return increases. And we have this exponential decay of value where we can clearly see that this is nonlinear and this approximates a exponential decay. We can also take a look at what happens if the company boosts its dividends. And right now we estimate that the dividend will be roughly $3.17, but we'll also take a look at what happens if it's $1.50 going up to $4.25. Let's run this. And here we have a linear relationship, which is different relative to the required market return that we just saw. And we can see that if we just increment the dividend, then it's a linear where the price will just continually increase along this line. And we have the slope, we can see that's well defined because it's linear. And that's something to think about. You can play around with the other parameters within here, cost of equity to see how that affects it. You can see what happens if you change beta 
and the risk-free rate, how that affects the price of the, the estimated stock. And it's just something to keep in mind whenever you see an estimate that how much it can vary based on some of these inputs. Moving on, we'll take a look at the multi-stage dividend discount model at this point, and this is what we're coding out next. What the multi-stage dividend discount model does is it's an equity valuation model that builds on the Gordon growth model by applying varying growth rates to the calculation. And the way that this differs is we focus on just a one dividend payment for the Gordon growth model. Here we can have a set of payments and we can see here that we have quarterly distributions for the Stanley Black & Decker where a stockholder is getting paid 79 cents in March, 79 cents in June, 79 cents in September, and 79 cents in November. And we also have this value here that's called a terminal value. And the way that this is calculated is we have this up here. And what we'll have to do in order to estimate the stock value using the multi-stage dividend discount model is we need to sum over all of these dividends, including the terminal value, discount it back to the present value to get an estimated value for the stock. And here we have the terminal value. You can study it some more, but it's just the expected dividend. Then we have the growth rate divided by the cost of equity minus the dividend growth rate. Then we also need to discount that back here. Okay. And I have some of the function already coded out just to make it a bit easier. I also have some documentation because there are a lot more parameters relative to the GGM and this is a more complicated model here. And just to quickly explain those parameters, for our model, you need to input the ticker that will scrape the data from Y Finance and bring it into our model. You'll need to put in a discount rate. In this case, that'll be the cost of equity, the dividend growth rate, the time frame. If you want to look at the dividends distributed over one year or two years, the number of future dividends which if you're going to do it for one year, for US stocks, they're, the dividend payments are usually, usually quarterly. So that'll be four future dividend payments. And then finally, the growth rate. In this case, we're going to set the time frame for a year, just like we have it illustrated here. So we just have one year of dividend payments. And then we also have the growth rate at zero, meaning that we expect Stanley Black & Decker just to pay 79 cents. If we wanted a different growth rate, then we can put in 5%. We'll play with these parameters down the line. The first thing I'll do is I am going to put in the ticker. And what the ticker is going to do is we're going to call yfinance.ticker. And for the ticker input, that's an input parameter that somebody can put in. We're also just going to put dot upper just in case that somebody puts it in lowercase so that the we can still scrape the data because it requires the ticker to be all caps. Next, we need to get the dividend history and I'm just going to copy and paste these line by line. And I'll also illustrate how these will work in the cells below. So we have our ticker here, and I am just going to put in SWK. And here we also want to get the dividend history. If we're estimated, estimating it, we can extrapolate future different, we can extrapolate the, our estimate by taking the past previous dividends and using them as our base for future dividends. And just to illustrate what this will look like, we have a few different things. 
the way that Y Finance brings in data is into a Pandas data frame. We're going to look at the dividends over a one year period. We just want to get the actual payments themselves. So anytime Y Finance will return all the days when the dividends aren't paid as well, which is why we need to use this conditional statement. Let's take a look at that. Over 2021, Stanley Black & Decker paid four dividends, two for 79 cents in November and September, and then two payments in June and March. What we can what we can see is most likely that we'll estimate that Stanley Black & Decker will use this last price in order to make the dividend payments and we can code that out we can code that assumption out as well and the way that we can do that is we can use it as the dividend estimate and what that's going to be is it's going to be a list where we're going to take the mode of the pandas data frame in this case the mode will return two values because the frequency is the same for 70 cents and 79 cents. But if we put in that we want the last value in the Panda series, then we'll get the 79 cents. Given that this is in a list, we can multiply the number of future different dividends to get our value. And that should give us a list of four 79 cent values. Let's take a look at that. And we have our future dividends that we estimate Stanley Black and Decker will distribute. And let's save that into a variable. I'll call that dividend estimate. Moving on, we also need to discount these values. We can see that these are distributed in different time periods. And because of that, we need to discount it based on the date that they're distributed minus the today's date, which at this point is January 3rd, 2022. And this will use list comprehension in order to do this. What we need to do is we need to, that's when we call in date time and pandas has its own date time values. So we need to do a bit of conversion. If you're working with Python for the first time, this might seem complex, don't worry. As you work more and more with pandas, you'll understand it. If we get the history of the index, what we're going to estimate is that the Stanley Black & Decker will still pay the dividends roughly in the same period of time. What we can do is we can just add 365 to each of these, which will pu push these future dividend payments to a year, which is what this does here. Then we need to subtract it by today's date, which is the date time now. And that brings it to various dates. And then we also want to convert it to days because the date time will return days and seconds and we're just really concerned with days. And then finally, we this is all on an annualized basis. So given the days, we want to divide it by 365 to get the annualized factor in order for us to discount those dates. Let's take a look at what this looks like. And here we have the different present value factors. So from here from January 3rd to March 8th, that's about a, a little less than a quarter of the way there, which is why it's 16%. If we go out to June 7th, that's a little less than halfway through a year, which is 40% of 41, 42% of the way there, so on and so forth. And if we look out in November, that's a almost a year, but not quite. So we're still not going to discount it by one. We need to discount, discount it by 90% of a year. And we'll save this into a variable as well. We can call this PV factor. Next, we have the dividend growth. And the way that we 
put in dividend growth is it's going to be the dividend within our dividend estimate. And we have one plus the growth rate, which in this case is going to be zero, meaning that we estimate that all of the dividend payments will be 79 cents with for Stanley Black and Decker over the next year. And we can take a look at that too. If we were estimating that the growth rate is going to be 5%, we'd have this increment over time and we're, we'd in, we wouldn't increase it by 5% each year. We'd increase it by the present value factor. So it will be a proportion of that year based on that date. But we're going to keep it at zero for now. Okay. Finally, we need to get the present value of all the dividends. We'll use the following line to get the present value of all the dividends. What we'll do is we'll take each of the dividends, divide it by one plus the cost of equity, raise it to our present value factor based on the date of the distribution to get the present value of the dividends. And we'll take a look at that. The present value of all the discounted dividends from Stanley Black & Decker we estimate will be $2.94. Moving on, we also need to calculate the terminal value. We'll do it with the following line. And it's exactly the same as we have in this calculation here. Let's take a look at what our terminal value estimate is. It's $35.97. And the way that we estimate the total price is we need to take the present value of all the dividends and add it to the terminal value. And our estimate is $38.91 for the current value of Stanley Black and & Decker. And this makes sense when we think about this relative to the Gordon growth value, because the Gordon growth just lumps that whole terminal value calculation into one, whereas for this, we break it into pieces. And that's why the value is much lower relative to the Gordon growth model. What you'll need to do is you'll need to take a look at the different parameters and how it affects the price, whether you want to grow the dividend over time, meaning you think the distributions will increase. You may also think that the distributions decrease, which you can put in a negative growth rate. And similar to what we did with the the Gordon growth model, looking how the what happens if we vary the required market return. We'll take a look at how that will affect the Gordon, the multi-stage dividend discount model. We have all of our estimates saved. And the final thing that we'll do is we'll graph this out. We can see similarly that we still have that exponential decay, but again, because we're not front we're not combining all the dividend, the terminal value is not the all lumped together like it was in the Gordon growth model. The multi-stage model, the values are a bit lower where if we have a 10% required market return, then we estimate it will just be above just $100 for the stock price, but it continues to fall in price as we increase the required market return. And we can also take a look at different stocks and how well our model does. We can look at what happens if we look at IBM. And our model values IBM at $162.83 when we have a discount rate of 6% and a dividend growth rate of 5% and IBM is another company where the where it pays out a good amount of dividends and it's been pretty steady with the payments over time. We can take a look at the current price of IBM to see how well our model does and just compare that. Given the parameters, it's 
a bit higher than the current price of IBM, but maybe IBM stock is legitimately is legitimately misvalued, but it's very unlikely because we have a very simple model here. But still, the dividend discount model is roughly in the range of error where we would expect it. We can also change some of the parameters. So instead of looking at the dividend payments over a one year period, we can look at dividend payments for IBM over two years. And we need to change the parameters about a bit where we have the time frame default at one year. We need to boost it up for two years. We also need to increase the number of future dividends to eight because there will be eight payments in total, four per quarter in the year. Let's run this. And we have a bit of a higher value now for our discount model, given that we have a longer time frame, more dividend payments, and that growth helps boost the value of the stock. We can also take a look at how the model does in valuing a company like Apple. Apple does pay dividends, but it's not known as a dividend paying company, meaning the dividend yield or the proportion of the dividend payment divided by the stock price isn't too high. And using the same discount rate and dividend growth rate, we can run it. We can see that the estimate for the price is $22.86, and that's pretty low because if we look at Apple's current price, it is a lot higher than this. And that just goes back to you the core focus it for Apple is it distributing dividend income. It's more reinvesting that dividend income in order to build free cash flow eventually down the line and reinvest in the company itself. But that's gets to a different potential model and Apple should most likely be valued using something called a discounted free discounted cash flow model and that may be a potential video I do down the line for that can be used for other stocks such as Apple. Right. Thank you for watching. I hope that this video was helpful. There are a lot of great resources that you can use to learn more about finance in general. I use Investopedia all, all the time just for general finance info. I think that they've done a great job in doing that. If you're more looking to study for the CFA or the FRM exam, I am a FRM and I use Bionic Turtle. Highly recommend it if you are studying for it and you're looking, learning concepts like the dividend discount model. And also highly recommend anything by Professor Aswath Damodoran. He is a very famous finance professor in NYU and he does the classical financial models like the dividend discount model, the discounted cash flow model, and looking at things like PE multiples. If you're looking to learn about just finance in general, highly recommend all the papers and content that he's put out. If you like this video, feel free to like and subscribe. You can also connect with me on LinkedIn, Twitter, and GitHub. Thanks for watching everyone and happy coding.